internet friends. Welcome to another episode of the Synergy Cafe online show featuring speaker, entertainer, close-up illusionist, and marketing alchemist, Magic Brad. It's the internet lifestyle show about career, finance, relationships, spirituality, and wellness. We're moving the online chatter over to real life activity. And now, please welcome your host of Synergy Cafe, Magic Brad. Hey, Internet friends, it's Magic Brad. Turn up your sounds so you can hear what's going on. I'm here on Synergy Cafe again, and I think it's a Monday, massive Monday, a motivational Monday, and we got Jonathan McCormick online. You there, Jonathan? Yes. Yay, and you said you were from Utah. Yep. I have been out there. It's beautiful driving through the mountains and seeing those red rocks, and it's kind of a, it's a cosmic experience. <laughs> yeah. So how long you lived in Utah? Um, I've been in Utah for about almost 20 years now. Wow. But you said you lived in Minneapolis when you were a kid. You were born here. Well, I lived in Minnesota. Minnesota. I was born in Long Prairie. So. Yeah, see, it's interesting how these things connect. You could have been anywhere in the world, but there you are. You're, I'm a native Minnesotan, lived here for 53 years in the same house, then got married, moved to the west side, then we moved to Asheville, now we're back here in Minneapolis again. We like it here. <laughs> so you get married and you got kids? Um, yes, I've got seven kids. What? A herd? <laughs> That's a lot of kids. That's a cool number, though. I love the number seven. Yeah. <laughs> so can you share a little bit about what your, uh, what your venture is? What, what, what's your mission? What you got going on? Well, um, you know, I recently wrote a book called The Investment Perspective. Um, it's about a parable in the Bible that Jesus gave about the parable of the talents. Um, and, you know, uh, largely... Um, a lot of the things, um, a lot of the things that Jesus said um, were taken from kind of a Christian perspective, and I'm I'm obviously a Christian, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be writing a book about uh, a parable of Christ. But um, but uh, you know, in in many instances, particularly in this story, um, it, it it's been interpreted very narrowly, and. Um, and this, this book that I've written, it's a very short book. I, I wrote it to be a, um, something that someone could consume um, on a lunch break, basically. It's very short, but it explores um, the, the key elements and the underlying motives that, um, that this story brings out in... Um, in everybody, and it, it doesn't, you know, it's it's not a story that's necessarily, it's not written to, um, you know, you have to realize that at the time that this was given, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, there was there was no Christian church, <laughs> you know, there was no group or body of people called Christians, you know, you know, Jesus himself was a Jew, and, um, you know, when you look at the key elements that run through the story, it, um, it, it gets at the emotions and the things that every single one of us experience, particularly when it when it hap when it comes to truth, and the risk and vulnerability that each of us have to um, expose ourselves to in the the great uh, the great um, questions of life and. And how do we actually grow in this life and come to something more than what we came here with? Can you summarize those elements? How, how many are there? Um, well, yeah, I think I can. Um, let me just hit a couple key parts of the story okay. just to give people cool. kind of an idea of, of, of what, I, what I go into. You know, this is probably a 15-minute thing, so it's, it's hard to go into all of it. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, <clears throat> so... Number one, you've got this story, and you've got these uh, three men, okay? And you, you have to begin to imagine what this meant. So these three guys are employees, and their employer is an investor. And he's leaving on a, uh, on a trip, right? And he gives to each of them a sum of money. Now, the first thing you have to realize about what he gave them is that the sum of money, you know, different scholars kind of vary on how much they would say it would be worth today, but it was no small sum of money. This was, um, 
this would be kind of like working for an investment firm where you're given, uh, you know, large, uh, um, large sums of money to invest. And they only have one thing that they have to do with it. When it's all said and done, they have to have more than what they came with. Now, of course, we know that the story is not about completely about money. You know, it's obviously um, has spiritual implications. It has um, has implications when it comes to uh, to our lives in other ways. But the one thing that that we can find kind of find a comparative to is is um, is the concept of of truth. You know, it's like when you consider well, what do we all come here to life with? Well, we're kind of given a package. Right, we you know we get a certain upbringing. We have maybe a certain spiritual or religious background. We have a certain concept of the way we see finance, the way that we see um, education, the way that we see other things, mm -hmm. and that's kind of our package, right? It's a certain set of uh, truths or a perspective on the one truth right. that <clears throat> that is a little bit different, and. Um, but here's the weird thing about the story is that in order for them to gain an increase, they would have to take, and you can imagine, this is a guy who's an employee, right? He's got a bag of gold sitting by his bed. And uh, maybe he's always imagined, you know, you know, it's like he loves ships. Or maybe the other guy likes uh, pearls and precious stones, right? So the guy goes down, he makes his investment. And he sets this huge sum of money at risk for the idea that there might be something more. And so when we look at our own lives, you know, if we, if we, if we look at, uh, you know, that package that we've all been given, you know, what does it take to consider the idea, you know, that everything I've believed, everything I've hoped for, Everything I've imagined might be wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and don't we see, don't we love the books and the people? We read them who they stared into the abyss of their own darkest fears. Um, you know, I'm, of course, I'm a Christian, obviously, so I read this book. You know, one of the, one of the writers that I love to read is C.S. Lewis. And I think one of the reasons that I like him so much is because. You know, he came from, he was an atheist before he became a Christian. And whether you're a Christian or not, that doesn't really matter. You know, some of the things that he said kind of go around different, they, they, it's, it's broad. But the thing that I like about what he said is that, you know, he peered into that dark place in his life. Well, what if there is no God? What if there is no higher force that guides everything? What if, and he stared that in the face. And what was the result? An increase. By his risk, by his vulnerability, he was able to, whether you agree with everything he said or not, he was able to maybe see something more. And the people who read his works, now they're making, you know, movies about, you know, his, uh, his children's series and stuff. And, you know, we could look at other people. We could look at Gandhi. We could look at Mother Teresa. What did it take for Mother Teresa, you know, to be inside this convent? that was safe. I mean, you imagine a woman, I think she was like 39 when she left the convent to go out and serve the, the people in Calcutta, the poorest of the poor. You know, it's like, what did it take for her to walk out and do that? You know, what did it take for Gandhi to, you know, to do something in a way, to, to take a risk on something that really had never been um, tried in the way that he did it? And, um, and so what we discover is an increase and, you know, it, we don't all have to increase, but so you, you asked for an overview. I'm trying to, to be brief. So let, let me give <laughs> a couple more points and then I'll let you ask some more questions. But, you know, so that's the one concept is that we have in the story, two servants who risk, who open themselves to vulnerability, open themselves to the idea that everything they thought, everything they believed might be wrong on the idea that some providential power you know, in, in finance, we talk about providence. Um, some providential power would bring that money back to you. Another pl in another place, Jesus talked about putting your bread out on the waters and they'll come back to you, things like that. You know, so, so we have 
two servants who do that, and then we have a third servant. And, you know, in a way, I would have liked, to, you know, it would have been nice to be able to write the book without talking about him because it's kind of scary. And it's weird. I never understood it as a kid reading this story. Here Jesus talks about this third servant. He comes back, oh, you did good, you did good. Then this third servant, he comes back, he still has all the money. And he gives it all back. He didn't lose it. He didn't put it at risk like the other two guys did. You know, he didn't anything, but he gives it back. And then what does the, the, the boss say? He says, you wicked servant, I'm throwing you into outer darkness. Well, I don't know what that is. But, you know, it doesn't sound good and it sounds scary. But as we consider, what happens to a person in their life when they insist that they have to be right? That they, under, they insist that their package, that their truth is the truth, you know? And they go around trying to convince everybody and they never, ever risk. They never open themselves to the idea that, well, maybe my little package is being raised to you know, a Baptist or a Hindu or a Muslim or whatever I was, or, or you know, my view of, of, uh, of life and the way things should be seen. They never open themselves to the idea that they might be wrong. They never risk. What happens? Is, can we not see in that group of people that it almost seems that they are in a darkness? Have you ever met somebody who, who is so, so convinced that they're right, that they can't, they just can't see past their own paradigm? Oh, all day long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that, that's, you know, people, you know, people can read the book and kind of see, you know, what that's about. But just so you get kind of an idea, you know, this, this book explores these two cosmic paradigms that end up resulting in gaining light, gaining understanding in this life, and having really having meaning in life. What are, what are the two cosmic paradigms? Well, the one being the idea that the only way that I can increase in truth, it doesn't mean that I haven't been given a package, I haven't been given truth as just a gift, as you know what, what, what was given to me, but the idea that if I, if I risk and I open myself to the idea that something more is needed than my own wit, my own ability to understand, that some providential power, that some whatever you want to call it, has to, has to open that gate for me. And being willing to risk, set it out there and say, that's the one paradigm, is the people who whose whose hearts are in a place of I I don't get this. Whatever power that may be, even if it's the, the higher power of, of, of cosmic unity of people or whatever, something more is needed to teach me that I may grow. The other paradigm is a paradigm of I can figure this out. I have figured this out and I need and, and I need no, I don't need that providential power and you know when I say this I'm not I'm not putting any label on what that providential power is but these people these two these two motives they drop they ride the same train to work they sit on the same pew in church they they attend the same seminars but it's a way of looking at the world. So is the two paradigms you're talking about, the people that will take risk and the others that will not take risk, the ones that want to play it safe versus the ones that are willing to roll the dice? Well, and yes, um, so long as we realize that there are risk takers who um, also believe that, that they have it figured out. There are there are people who roll the dice. What is every what day. is it? Um, it's all like Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it? What is it? Figure it out. You mean the game of life? The game of the game of life. Okay. Well, sure. and, and understanding that what we're all after is something more than you know, like we, you're talking about risk, you know. And the, the struggle is that you know, it's like um, 
the, the book definitely applies to money, for sure. But we have to realize that there is something that we're all after in life more than the money. We're hoping that that if 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 I can get ahead of the game and not have to be scrounging for every penny, that that will bring some sort of meaningfulness in my life. And that's the very thing that, you know, if we believe that, um, see, I would say that you're right in the sense that, yes, you know, those who take risk, but if we're taking risk with the idea, oh, I've got this figured out. If I can make X amount of dollars or else if I can, you know, achieve this amount of success in life or if I can do this or this or the other thing, then I'll find meaning. But then we discover that many people who do do that, what do they discover? They discover that we see it every day in the tabloids. They didn't find the meaning they were hoping for. Their lives, they don't have that happiness and that fulfillment that they hoped that they would have. But people who take that risk, people who say, you know, who, and also who their their lives, you consider the risk, the, the idea that there are people who they, they make a product, they play a game, they, they do their thing in life, but somehow it's about something more that it's about the it's about the thing itself that product that thing and the people who don't risk inside end up discovering that um i'm trying to talk too fast i think <laughs> <laughs> well you know risk is sort of a relevant rel relative term too because for some people it's a risk to walk across the street when it's a you know when there's a no walk sign to me, it's like, is there traffic there? I'll go across. And if it's close, it, it's not bad unless I get hit. You know, I'm this yeah. far away, I'm okay. So is it a risk? So risk is pretty much a, that's nebulous in and of itself. <laughs> so that even well, the, and... the game of life, what is it? Because there's other people that just manage their money correctly. They don't buy that BMW that they don't really need. And they make enough money and they, they live their life. They go out to brunch. They have fun. They go to a cheap place for brunch. So it doesn't cost them a bunch. Then there's other people that are the go-getters that buy the Lamborghini and bust their butt to try and make stuff happen. And they're happy because they're thriving off of chaos and energy and trying to create. Then there's others that are just passive. So it, it's all a nebulous and relative to a person's life. Right. <laughs> right. I see what right. you're saying. So, there are the people so that would can, be. You can kind of see the themes, uh, but I, I'm, yep. I, I'm wondering if I'm doing a good of just job of kind of describing. It, it really is an inward thing. It's kind of a heart thing that yeah. I'm talking about in the book. It's. I, I wish I could. I wish I could pin it down onto. Uh, well, if you do this, well, then you'll get the game of life. But we all know it's like that's why we have the synergy cafe. You know, it's it's like, you know. <laughs> We haven't got it figured out. And isn't that the fun of the game of life? Well, part of it is not figuring it out. Because yes. it wouldn't be any fun if you knew what was going to happen. It was kind of like, here we go again. I'm going to work at 9 o'clock, and I'm going to do my little thing on the assembly line. At 5 o'clock, I punch out, go home, eat, go to sleep, wake up, and do it again. And it wouldn't be any right. fun. So it's nice to have that uh, that curve around the corner where you don't know what's happening in life. Um to me, the game of life is just six, uh, is, uh, is solving the puzzle of mass, energy, space, and time. It's just putting those things together. That's a Scientology term that I'm not into, but I know of it. <laughs> yeah. But that's what it is. It's where you're going to put your energy, how you're going to spend your time. And because we're physical beings, there's mass to us, so we've got to deal with it rather than being etheric and all-knowing like the all-knowing yeah. deity. <laughs> Well, can I maybe throw one more thing out too? You know, as you talk about that, you mentioned the the the, the time puncher. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, we can all relate with that sort of. You know, it's like that's it's the one hell we're all trying to get away from. You know, is that our <laughs> my life choice. at the end is just going to be punching a clock. You know, it's a choice. Um, but but you know, when you consider too. So here's a thought. You know, each one of us has to go make a living. And, you know, we've got to do something with our, our bodies and minds. It's like, you know, I'm going to, am I going to meditate today? Am I going to pray? Am I going to, you know, we all have to do something to try to, you know, to, to, to take care of this soul body thing we've been given, you know, but it's like, it's interesting to see too, that it's like each of us at certain points in our lives are kind of given, you know, this chance where it's like, we know there's something we should do. We know there's something that is calling us 
that it doesn't make any sense as far as it's like, you know, we've got our trajectory, you know, this is where I'm going, this is where I'm doing, this is, you know, but that thing comes along, you know, I, I'll give you a, a small example from my own life. Years ago, you know, my wife and I didn't have a ton of money at the time. And uh, I am... Um, I had a friend who was into like building these alternative sorts of structures, like, you know, there's earth ships and they're like mm -hmm. eco-friendly, you know, and things like that. Well, he wanted, he was setting up this class for this certain type of, uh, of building he was going to build on his property in the middle, out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, um, I wasn't really into that sort of thing very much. I was kind of looking into it, but it was a thousand bucks to take the class. And he called me and says, Hey, it's a thousand bucks to take this class. You know, and at the time I didn't really have a thousand bucks to spare on it, but it was kind of strange. I, I just kind of knew I should, I mean, that sounds so weird, you know, but it was like, there was kind of an inward voice that said, you know, you need, you need to go do this. You need to go do this. And, you know, and so I said, okay, I'll do it. My wife was mad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like, we didn't really have the money. It's like, what are you doing? You're going to go pay, to, you know, go to this thing. And I went out, you know, it was interesting. It, well, it wasn't about the, whatever we built, you know, it's like, it was a ton of work, but you know, there were discussions that happened while I was out there, a friendship that developed while I was out there that if I hadn't risked on that kind of inward voice, that it never would happen. I ended up being business partners with that man. And we had a very successful business. And I learned a lot, not about building ships, but about things that I needed to understand during that trip. Mm -hmm. Sure. Does that make sense? Oh, that, it, to that kind it, of it totally does. I mean, like I said, risk is pretty much a perceived reality. Um, like, as an example, um, I've been in some ne network marketing type businesses, and I've done some of them where I didn't make my money back. But the friendships I've got and the personal growth that I got was way more inexpensive than college. So yeah. it depends on the perception of what you're investing into. I mean, you, you can't fail if you don't quit. And when you die, if there is a higher being and a heaven and a God, you go there and you do it. If there isn't, then you're dead and you're rotten. And so what? Now what? So it depends on your perception of risk. Like, oh my God, I don't want to go to hell. I'll be so yeah. sad the whole eternity. It's, it's dangerous and scary. Then you're already defeated. <laughs> Right. And, 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 and right now it's, I look at, you know, it's like everybody's talking about going to heaven or hell. It's like, well, you know, I don't know. I, I see heaven and hell right now. I mean, I, I think we all see that it's, it's, uh, for, for me, you know, it's like, I look at this parable and I'm just struck by it just by the fact that, you know, it's like, you know, Jesus kind of got it. It's like, you know, when you live your life in that cramped space, you know, where I've got it, I don't care whether you're punching a clock, whether you're, you know, where you live in that world, where you're constantly defending, uh, 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 you know, some sort of concept of what, the way you see God or the way you see the world or the way you see everything else. And, and your life is one, you know, it's like one box and that you're constantly defending. Yeah. And that, you know, it's like, you know, that is hell. But the idea that, you know, it's like things go good, things go bad, but, you know, to learn, to grow, to meet people, to, to gain relationships, yeah. you know, to be open to the fact that, you know, like you said, those ventures that didn't bring you, you know, that much money, but, um, it's a perception it of how you look at it. I've, uh, I no longer drink alcohol. I don't consume alcohol. I probably haven't for 20 or 30 years or something like that. And the reason was I got multiple DWIs and I quit drinking. So I don't miss it at all. But the, the stuff I went through educated me to not consume alcohol. And then uh, the reason I was I passed through Utah is when I turned 40, everything collapsed and I lost all my money and didn't have anything else. And I thought, what the hell am I doing here in Minneapolis? So I drove out to California with a sleeping bag and I slept on a karate school floor. I didn't need any money. <laughs> I got enough yeah. to eat and it was okay. And I learned there that you can survive with very, very little. It's, and I'm still here. You know, I didn't have a bunch of money, but I'm still here, right? And now I'm back in Minneapolis, and I'm making enough. I've got a place, a roof over my head. It's all good. So, again, that is what I mean by risk. 
I mean, there's some things yes. that it's probably not a good idea. To, okay, I'm going to take all the money in my bank account and I'm going to put it on uh, blackjack. <laughs> it's probably not a good idea, but you're not going to die as soon as the money's gone. You go out and you make more. You figure it out. Maybe you hold a little cardboard side saying, please help, I lost all my money on blackjack. <laughs> it's just part of life, you know. You just deal right. with it. <laughs> Anyways. Well, that's, that's how you grow. Anyways, that's how you grow. Before I you know, ask my... When it's all said oh, and done, ahead. we'll have a little more than what we came here with. Is, I mean, isn't that, you know, it's like, we're, don't we want to get to the end and say, wow, you know, that was hard and that was good and fun and wow, you know, I think I learned something. Well, that's the thing with, with investing money. I mean, like I said, when I had, when I didn't have money, I was in California and I'd go to the coffee shop and I'd buy coffee for $1.25 and I'd put chocolate in it and cinnamon in it and sugar in it and cream and mix it up and I'd have a mocha. Yeah. Now I got a little more money, so I go to Starbucks and I give them $3.50 or whatever the hell it is for it. Yeah. So it's all relative. It's the same shit. <laughs> yeah. um, before I ask my favorite question, and we've gone, we've got plenty of time here, so I'm going to ask my favorite question, but tell us how we can get a hold of your book and how we can connect with you and all that kind of things. you got a website or something like that? Yeah, so the, the website's jamccormick.net, and um, so jamccormick.net, and you can uh, subscribe to my, my email list there, um, and I'm not going to email you with anything other than just, you know, um, you know if, I'm, if I'm speaking somewhere or, or if I come sure. out with another book or whatever. Um, oh goodness! And the book is on Amazon, so buy it on Amazon. You can go. You can go to my website and get to it there too. Um, and uh, and the name of the connect. book again? Go ahead, sir. The name. It's of the investment perspective. Investment perspective. That's good because uh, you know people when people first think of the word investment, they right away they think money, just like I did. I thought you were in finance, but to me, it's a matter of investing your time, energy, money. Just energy, basically. Reinvesting your energy. Where are you putting your time? Where are you putting your thinking? Where are you investing your... Like the guy that hold, held on to all the money, he didn't do nothing with it. He was like a stagnant swamp. Why not put it into something? Maybe something will come out. If not, more money, more knowledge. So, here's my favorite question. That's the big why question. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why aren't you like a uh, school teacher or a ski instructor or... or doing being a tour guide out in Utah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because um, the reason why is because, you know, this is for me a, um, it's kind of a cul culmination of a, of a life in a way. You know, I never planned on writing, um, but over the course of my life, you know, I, I've never done well working for somebody, although I have here and there. Um, but, you know, I've owned various small, just lost my earbuds. <laughs> I've I've owned various small businesses, and um, you know about oh goodness four years ago I uh, I had a business that was doing pretty well and it just tanked and um, you know looking back I can see things I would have I would have done but I was able to actually sell it um, to somebody who was able to do something with it and then I made a series of investments that uh, didn't turn out that well. You know, I still had some money coming in from the business that I sold. Um, but long story short, is it culminated in one day going camping, being on a mountain and saying, you know, kind of, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And the thought came, you know, share your perspective. You have a perspective. You see things that other people don't see. Sure. And I started writing. And um, I wasn't planning on that. It was just kind of something that came. It was like a, an unexpected uh, dividend on, you know, uh, 40 years of investments. And um, I do it because it's my survival. It's, uh, I have this feeling, it's like if I don't, if I don't speak and say what's inside of me, it's like it kind of feels like it just starts to canker and rot there. It's just something I do because express yourself. I need to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm uh, going to close this one off. It's gone quite a bit long. I got to beam it up to okay. the internet, but maybe we'll do another one sometime. But I appreciate okay. you taking the day today on Synergy Cafe, Jonathan. And again, Thank the name you. of the book is? The Investment Perspective. Investment Perspective. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Peace, love, and happiness. Thank you very much.
Thank you.